the mist was a cold comfort, clinging to Sarah's skin the same way silence clung to the mountains. It hid her, but it hid other things too. The crackle of a branch always made her flinch, rifle raised, but it was usually just a doe slipping through the dawn. Today felt different. The stillness was too thick. The birds weren't calling. Back in Mayview, they'd be setting up for the Founders' Day bash already. Garish banners strung across Main Street, the smell of the old barbecue pit starting to cut through the ever-present pine scent. Her dad would be lecturing volunteers about the exact way to stack the firewood for the bonfire, his booming preacher's voice softened only slightly by age. Sarah almost missed it. The ache of the familiar, even if it was wrapped up in Mayview's particular brand of stifling tradition. She'd left for the army the day she turned 18, swearing never to look back. Yet six years on, here she was, because a dying town was better than no town at all, apparently. A flash of movement, low to the ground. Not a doe. Too bulky, the gate wrong. Sarah went still, rifle trained on the brush. Something lumbered out into a patch of weak sunlight. Its shape was off. Distended limbs, a hunch to its shoulders. It was an animal, not entirely. A ragged, rasping sound drifted through the heavy air. The thing was watching her. Its eyes burned an impossible yellow amidst mismatched features. A mix of pity and revulsion twisted in Sarah's gut. Whatever it was, it had been someone once, a Mayview stubborn old cuss maybe. Then the virus had gotten to them. Everyone knew the stories, hikers vanishing, those strange sightings on the border roads. Yet, just like with Founders Day and the Bible readings, the town had filed it away under things dealt with later. Well, later was here now, and it was staring at her mutated deer carcass breakfast. A gunshot cracked the silence. The creature jolted, let out another of those horrific rasps, and darted back into the undergrowth. Sarah stood, suddenly shaking. She had to get back, warn them. But warn them what? That their worst nightmares had strolled out of the mist? It wouldn't be enough for Mayview. They needed proof, and that thing was already long gone. The trail back was both familiar and unsettlingly alien. The forest floor wasn't so quiet now, prickling with unseen movement. Whispers seemed to follow in the breeze, or was it her own panicked breath? Each glimpse of a hunched shadow behind a tree made her trigger finger tighten. Mayview came into view at last, a sprawl of weathered wood clinging to the mountainside. The festive decorations looked sickly garish against the muted backdrop of forest and brooding clouds. Not the homecoming she'd imagined, even in her more honest moments. No time for sentiment. Sarah cut straight through to her father's cabin, ignoring the curious glances. Her dad was on the porch, wrestling a particularly uncooperative strand of festive lights. He always insisted on doing it himself, a gesture of old-school, preacher-man self-reliance that normally irritated Sarah to no end. Today, it was a sliver of sanity to cling to. Dad, she burst out, the words raw in her throat, I saw one. He didn't turn, hands steady on the tangled lights, one what, Sarah? One too many sips of moonshine at this hour? One of them. Out in the woods, it looked at me, it was... The words failed her. How do you describe the twisting of a person into a nightmare? The way those yellow eyes held something familiar and utterly vacant all at once. A sigh, the rustle of his work coat. Finally, he faced her. There were new lines creasing his face, deeper than the ones she remembered. Mayview pride had always demanded a strong front, but the worry was seeping through now. Come inside, he said, his voice low. Not in order but not a question either. The cabin smelled of wood smoke and old coffee. Sarah collapsed into a threadbare armchair, the rifle heavy across her lap, suddenly useless. He poured two mugs from the battered pot, the ritual somehow comforting. Tell me exactly what you saw, he prompted, setting a mug down in front of her. It was chipped, decorated with a faded cartoon bear. She'd hated that mug as a kid. So, she told him, every twisted detail, his face grimmer with each word. When she was done, silence hung between them, thicker even than the mountain mist. You believe me then? The question was a plea, childish and desperate. He took a slow sip of the bitter coffee. 
folks have been talking, whispers, but Sarah. His gaze met hers unflinching, we hold on to normal until it's torn from our grasp. This, this ain't normal. The news didn't spread, it exploded. Sarah might have been the one to bring the proof, but it was as if the whole town had been holding its breath, waiting for the other shoe to drop. The festive banners were torn down, replaced by a frantic bustle. Trucks rumbled down roads meant for horses more often than cars, doors were barred, windows boarded up. Mayview had always prided itself on self-sufficiency. Gardens were raided for early crops, hunting rifles cleaned and oiled instead of displayed above fireplaces. Yet, underneath the productive frenzy, there was that familiar undercurrent Mayview didn't do cooperation so well. Reckon we ought to send a party out, clear those woods, one of the men declared at a hastily called town meeting. It was Carl Bennett, voice always booming, leading hunts and volunteer fire crews alike. Sarah, lurking near the back, tensed. We don't know what we're up against. Sending folks out blind is... Afraid, girl, Carl cut her off, a sneer twisting his usually jovial face. Thought you were army. Some of the others shifted, an uneasy murmur rippling through the crowd. Her dad, standing stoic as a stone statue by the podium, just watched the exchange. Sarah swallowed, forcing down the sharp retort. Carl rallied men with bluster, not reason tactics. It was Martha Ellis, of all people, who broke the tension. Prim, church-going Martha, whose cookies Sarah usually dodged at socials. We ain't got time for squabbling. Sarah's right, we need to know what's out there first. Heads turned in surprise. Then came nods of agreement, a reluctant respect for the girl who defied Mayview norms and somehow still come back. Sarah hid the flicker of hope. Maybe, just maybe, this disaster could crack their shell of isolation open a bit. Her dad stepped forward then, drawing the attention back to him. We hold, he said, his preacher's voice carrying across the room despite its quietness. We hold and we watch. Lord will grant us wisdom, same as always. A familiar chorus of agreement, but now some voices were hesitant. Mayview folk obeyed, but the conviction was starting to waver under the weight of a new kind of fear. Sarah didn't share their faith, but she knew that uncertainty. A rifle was real, but it didn't soothe the gnawing dread of the unknown. Her plan began to form on the walk home. Not sleep, not that night. There was a high ridge just outside of town, old logging spot view of the whole valley and the twisting paths that led into it. If anything was coming for Mayview, she'd be the first to see it coming. The climb was agony, muscles protesting after too many days on edge. Yet Sarah pushed on, fueled by a mix of stubbornness and a gnawing dread. By the time the first stars cut through the dusk, she reached the ridge and collapsed, ragged breaths burning her lungs. Mayview lay below, a huddle of flickering lights against the encroaching dark, it looked so small, so fragile, and a new feeling pierced through Sarah's resolve, a sense of protectiveness she'd never felt before. They might be pig-headed and maddeningly set in their ways, but they were hers. Movement on the road below dragged her attention back. Not the clumsy shamble of the transformed, but purposeful. Headlights, three sets, bouncing on the rough track. Subs, not the usual locals beat up trucks. Sarah scrambled for the old binoculars her dad kept in his hunting pack. The vehicles stopped a good distance from town, shadowy figures spilling out. Using the dim moonlight, she made out flashes of metal uniforms outsiders. Exactly who they were, she couldn't tell, and that made her hand tighten on the rifle stock. Mayview had a long history of repelling do-gooders, from conservationists to social workers. Would these be any different? The night stretched on. She watched the figures circle the edge of town, flashlights cutting through the darkness. No direct approach, which was either cautious or cunning. Closer to dawn, they retreated, leaving Sarah chilled and unsettled. A whole new threat, on top of the lurking one the townsfolk only half believed in. The first tendrils of dawn painted the sky, just as she spotted movement near the treeline. Not the nightmarish forms she'd come to dread, but people three of them, edging out of the forest with slow, hesitant movements. Young, from the look of them, faces gaunt and pale. 
they didn't head toward town. Instead, they slumped by the creek, drinking with a desperate urgency. Sarah hesitated, every instinct screaming to stay hidden. But something about them wasn't right. She inched closer, rifle held low, not as a threat, but a strangely comforting weight. When she was within shouting distance, one of them jolted upright, eyes widening in fear. Don't shoot, a girl's voice cracked with exhaustion. Sarah lowered the rifle fractionally. I ain't gonna, who are you? The girl, scraggly but with defiance in her eyes, stood. The other two followed, mirroring her tense stance. We're from Pine Creek, the girl said, got out while we could. They're coming, it's bad. It didn't take much prodding to get the rest of the grim story. Pine Creek, the next town over, had fallen overrun. These three had barely escaped, witnessing the true horror of what that twisted virus could do. Mayview has to know, Sarah said, the words heavy. Mayview had to know, but would they listen this time? The three from Pine Creek Jamie, Ben, and a quiet kid who never gave his name trailed after Sarah with a defeated acceptance of the truly terrified. Mayview greeted them not with open arms, but with suspicious glares and hastily barred doors. Sarah marched straight to her father's cabin, the newcomers shuffling awkwardly behind. He was inside, hunched over a crackling old radio, twisting the dial with the tense focus of a man searching for a lifeline. The sound of strangers entering sent his hand to the shotgun propped ominously by the door. Dad, wait! Sarah held up a hand, then gestured to Jamie, who stepped forward, pale and shaking slightly. We saw it happen, Jamie choked out, her voice rough with strain. Pine Creek, they came in the night. Things, people changed, it was. She trailed off, eyes haunted. A long silence fell. Sarah's father slowly lowered the shotgun, but the grim set to his face deepened. He flicked the radio off, the static replaced by a heavy quiet. Tell me everything, he said at last. Each word was measured, a man clinging to control in a world tilting into chaos. So they told him. The whispering onset, neighbors turning on each other with horrific speed, the desperate scramble of those who'd managed to escape, the haunting emptiness left behind. Jamie's voice broke when she described her parents, what they'd become. Sarah found herself handing the girl a chipped mug, the hot, bitter coffee a small offering of shared grief. When the story was told, her father didn't speak for a long, agonizing moment. Then he sat heavily, head bowed, the lines on his face seeming deeper than ever. The weight of this decision, the crushing responsibility, aged him visibly before their eyes. We can't hold, he finally whispered, the words a bitter echo of his declaration days before. We barricade the roads, gather what supplies we can, and retreat higher. Retreat. The word hung in the air, heavy as a death sentence. Mayview pride was built on unyielding defiance, not turning tail and running. But Sarah saw a flicker of something else in his eyes, a desperate, calculated focus replacing the weary resignation. Where? It was Ben who spoke, his voice surprisingly steady for one so young. Old Miller Place, Sarah replied, already piecing the plan together. Abandoned mine workings up there. Enough supplies stashed to last a good while. And defensible. Her dad gave a curt nod. It's settled then. But we don't announce it like a damn funeral procession. Word leaks out. Could be panic. Folks making a run for it. His voice took on that old commanding tone. We do this organized, or it'll be a slaughter faster than any creature can manage. Mayview might retreat, but it would do so with grim, stubborn efficiency. That Sarah realized with a jolt was their strength. Not glorious battle, but the harsh knowledge of how to survive in a land that demanded it, even from its gentler souls. The retreat was more of a forced march. Pickup trucks rattled along makeshift roadblocks, loaded with salvage supplies. Bags of dried beans, jerrycans, stacks of firewood. There were arguments, even a fistfight swiftly broken up by Sarah, but the underlying rhythm was that of a people with a grim purpose, not blind panic. Sarah scouted ahead, Ben and Jamie beside her. Pine Creek survivors were haggard, but the knowledge they carried was vital now. 
They follow tracks, Jamie murmured, pointing at a scattering of broken branches. Not much for brains left, but hunting instinct. The air grew colder the higher they climbed. Wind whistled through the skeletal remains of the miller's house, and the yawning entrance to the mine was a black maw in the mountainside. Sarah had been up here only a few times as a child, curiosity warring with the tales of cave-ins and miners' ghosts. Now it was their last stand. Inside was a maze of tunnels, some wide enough for old ore carts, others barely passable crawls. Supplies were hauled deeper, stashes camouflaged. Lanterns were set up at strategic points, casting eerie, flickering shadows against rough-hewn rock. We bottleneck them, Sarah explained as they worked, her voice echoing in the cold space. Force whatever comes at us down one path, hold them there. It sounded good in theory, horrifying in reality. The Mayview folk didn't take to the confinement well. They were used to open spaces to the sweep of the sky above them. The echoing drip of water and the press of the earth above made them twitchy, their voices too loud in the unnatural silence. Sarah found her dad hunched alone, staring into a flickering lantern. His shoulders slumped, not with the burdens of leadership, but something heavier. We ain't meant to live like moles, he muttered, his voice rough. We survive, she countered, her own voice surprisingly firm. Survive, figure this thing out, then we retake what's ours. The old Mayview stubbornness burned in her too, bright and fierce. He looked up then, meeting her gaze, and a hint of the old preacher's steel flickered in his eyes. Survive we will then, daughter, by God or by sheer grit. He stood then straighter but let's give them something to survive for. The barricade took shape quickly. Old timbers, mining carts, even a rusted boiler dragged into place. They'd funnel the attack to that choke point, hold them as long as possible. What happened after? Sarah refused to let her mind go there. Her dad's words echoed surprisingly the next morning. A bonfire was rigged at the mine entrance, acrid smoke billowing out to fill the valley. It wasn't subtle, but it wasn't meant to be. It was bait and a challenge. Maybe you don't hide, Sarah muttered, the wind whipping at her words as she watched from the ridge. It was a fool's gamble, but in their own strange way, it was perfect. They came in the twilight, not in a chaotic rush, but with a chilling methodical pace. Grotesque figures stumbling from the tree line drawn by the smoke. One, two, a dozen more emerging from the gathering darkness. Sarah's hand tightened on the rifle stock, fighting the urge to open fire too soon. Down in the makeshift camp, a hush had fallen. She could see the flickering torchlight reflecting in the narrowed eyes of Mayview's hunters, the trembling hands of those who'd never thought they'd have to use their heirloom rifles for real. Her father stood at the forefront, not with a weapon, but the worn, leather-bound Bible that had been passed down through generations. The first few transformed lurched toward the fire with mindless hunger. A ragged volley of gunshots echoed off the mountain, and they dropped, twitching into the dirt. The others kept coming. Hold, Sarah yelled, her voice almost lost in the wind. Hold until they had enough of their monstrous force lured into the killing ground. The anticipation was its own kind of torture. The transformed figures, some vaguely familiar, twisted versions of neighbors and kin, filled the valley floor. Then, with a grim nod towards her father, she gave the signal. The bonfire collapsed inwards in a shower of sparks triggered by a crude rope and pulley system. In the same instant, lanterns were smashed at the mine entrance, plunging their carefully prepared battlefield into darkness. Confused, the creatures thrashed for a moment, then their grotesque senses honed in on the sound of harsh breathing, the glint of fearful eyes deeper in the mine. The barricade held the first wave, the gunshots deafening in the confined tunnel. But there were too many, and they clawed with terrible strength at the makeshift barrier. A section of timber buckled with a splintering crash, and Sarah was face to face with a horror that had once been old Mrs. Peters, who always had cookies for the neighborhood kids. She fired, more on instinct than aim, and the thing dropped. But behind it came more, their rasping moans echoing in the tunnels. Sarah retreated backwards, shouting a frantic warning to the others. One by one, lanterns were extinguished ahead of the oncoming wave, 
plunging them deeper into darkness. Chaos reigned. There was no time for aimed shots, just the desperate struggle to reload, to push back the clawing, snapping tide. She saw Carl go down, a look of shocked disbelief on his face as he was dragged into the writhing mass. The old hunting rifle fell from his hands. Sarah lunged for it, firing wildly as she heaved him back. She was vaguely aware of her father at the very rear, not firing, but his voice, the preacher's voice, booming out Bible verses above the din. Whether it calmed the terrified or spurred on the desperate, Sarah couldn't tell. Then they reached the final bend, the last sliver of light. Beyond lay a half-collapsed tunnel their escape hatch, or their tomb. Sarah didn't hesitate. She grabbed Carl, one arm surprisingly strong under the wave of panic, and hauled him bodily towards the last dim lantern flickering near the collapsed tunnel. He was sputtering blood, eyes wide with shock, but alive, and that was all that mattered right now. Behind them, the press of monstrous bodies was too much. The barricade shattered under their mindless assault, a flood of grasping hands and snapping jaws. In, Sarah shoved Carl through the low opening, squeezing in behind him, the old rifle a dead weight in her hands. Her father's voice boomed one last defiant verse, then was abruptly cut off. Someone smashed the last lantern, and the world went utterly black. But she knew this tunnel, the half-buried support beam, the dip in the floor where water pooled. They moved by instinct, fueled by a terror that was slowly twisting into cold fury. The creatures thrashed behind them, their rasping snarls amplified in the echoing dark. A hand, twisted and too long, clawed at Sarah's ankle. She kicked backward, a jolt of pain shooting up her leg, but managed to scramble forward. The tunnel narrowed. One of the transformed couldn't squeeze through, its frustrated moans fading behind them. Hope, as thin and fragile as a guttering candle flame, flickered in Sarah's chest. If they could just reach the collapsed section, they might be able to block it entirely, seal themselves off. Ben, Ben was there, grabbing her hand, pulling her along. Shortcut, he rasped, the scraggly kid mustering a surprising surge of strength. Old air vent comes out farther up. In the pitch blackness, she couldn't tell where he was leading them, just trusted blindly. The air grew colder damp. They scrambled up through a slick shaft, too narrow for the creatures lumbering behind. When they burst back into the fading daylight, Sarah gasped for breath, the mountain air sharp as ice in her burning lungs. Carl slumped against a rock, bleeding and half-conscious. Behind them, the mine entrance was only a black smudge against the mountain. Muffled sounds drifted up, the trapped creatures venting their senseless rage, Ben collapsed beside Sarah, exhaustion dragging him down. Only a handful emerged, herself, her father miraculously alive, Ben, Jamie, a few of the hunters. The rest, lost in the darkness. We did it, Ben whispered, the words barely audible over the rasping breaths of the wounded. His voice was a mix of awe and horror. We held him off. It was far from a glorious victory. Yet, as Sarah surveyed the battered survivors, something undeniable kindled in her gut. They'd been a stubborn, bickering town, but now, they were hardened, tempered. They'd done the unthinkable and survived when no one, least of all themselves, expected it. Her dad stumbled over, his face streaked with grime and something darker. He looked at what was left of his flock and nodded grimly. We did it, he echoed, and this time, there was a different sort of iron in his voice. The aftermath was a numb blur. Makeshift camp on a barren outcropping, the bitter wind their only mournful song. Salvaging what supplies they could, burying their dead as best they managed on the frozen earth. Sarah moved through it all with grim efficiency, shoving down the grief that threatened to crack her open. Her father was different. The fight had hollowed him out, but left behind a core of cold determination. When he called the ragged survivors together, there were no Bible verses this time, just a hunter's sharp assessment of the lay of the land. They won't stay penned up forever, he explained, his voice raspy. We can't neither. Need to scout, see how far this rot has spread. It took every ounce of Sarah's army training to choke down the protest. Outnumbered, poorly armed, facing an enemy they barely understood. 
it was a suicide mission. But she looked around at those worn faces, saw the same stubborn defiance mirrored back, and realized Mayview didn't operate by her logic anymore. The scouts were chosen with grim practicality, Sarah and Ben for their knowledge of the terrain Jamie because, well because she'd watched her own town fall with a chilling clarity. It was a desperate gamble, staking the lives of their precious few on the word of those marked by horror. They descended at dawn, not as soldiers now, but shadows slipping through the forest. There were signs of the creature's passage, snapped branches, clawed marks on trees, the lingering stench of decay. A cold dread gnawed at Sarah. Mayview had held, but the world beyond was rapidly falling. The first sign of civilization, if you could call it, that made them freeze, a makeshift camp swarming with figures that were both horribly familiar and utterly alien. A ragged nest built from looted houses and twisted scrap metal. They're devolving, Jamie whispered, a note of horrified fascination in her voice. Some of the transformed moved with a chilling coordination, herded others, seemed to be crafting crude tools. It wasn't mindless destruction anymore, but a gruesome sort of order. From their vantage point, Sarah made another chilling discovery. Crude watch posts were being erected on the bordering hills. They were cutting Mayview off entirely. The retreat back to their mountain refuge was grim. The news was worse than expected. Mayview was an island in a rapidly spreading sea of infection. Her father didn't flinch from the brutal truth. We ain't just surviving, he declared as the shadows deepened around their meager fire. We're fighting back. The words hung heavy in the air. This wasn't about bravado, but a bone-deep weariness of being hunted. Sarah, hardened by days of horrors, felt the same defiant rage settle within her. Maybe this was their human strength, born from the same bedrock as their usual stubbornness. They refused to just be victims. The next morning, their camp wasn't just a refuge anymore. It was starting to look like a crude fortress, a testament to a people who knew one thing above all else how to endure against all odds. Mayview's transformation was slow, agonizing, and utterly relentless. Survival wasn't enough they had to adapt, and fast. Raiding parties, lean and deadly quiet, slipped down the slopes under cover of night, returning with salvaged supplies not just for existence, but for a fight they barely dared hope for. Sarah turned into a grim specter haunting the valley. She observed the twisted parodies of settlements the creatures made, noting their crude order, their weaknesses. Ben became her shadow, his sharp eyes and survivors' instinct an unexpected asset. They relayed their findings with ruthless practicality, and Mayview folk listened in a way they never had to her before. The first sign of change came from an unlikely source old man Ellis, not a hunter, but a tinkerer, his shed a marvel of odd contraptions. He'd been studying the scavenged tech, the bits and pieces dragged back from towns infected too far gone. His eyes burned with feverish intensity. Calms, he muttered, when Sarah tracked him down amidst a jumble of wires and half-disassembled radios. Them things, they ain't just driven by hunger. They're signaling, coordinating somehow. It was the breakthrough they desperately needed, their next raid targeted not food or weapons, but a battered military surplus store. With agonizing care, Ellis pieced together a makeshift receiver, an antenna rigged high on the ridge where Sarah had first stood watch. The sounds that emerged from the crude speaker were chilling moans layered with clicks and static bursts. Yet, with Jamie's help, patterns started to form. Crude, but undeniably purposeful communication. If we can disrupt that, Sarah trailed off, the possibilities blooming in her military-trained mind. Misdirection, cutting off the larger nests, they could turn the creature's own twisted order against them. Yet to disrupt, they had to build. Mayview became a place of frantic industry. Ellis contraptions, powered by old car batteries, hummed with stolen energy. Smithy fires roared as hunters repurposed their rifles into crude spears and snares, even the women, usually relegated to healing and keeping the home fires alive, now trained with a grim practicality that shocked Sarah to her core. Their first attempt was a near disaster. The bait livestock salvaged in a desperate raid drew too many of the transformed. 
hunters barely managed to pull back in time, the makeshift traps failing at the last moment. Yet amidst the grim tally of wounded and barely averted defeat, there was a flicker of defiant satisfaction. We made M change course, Carl, still recovering but barking orders with his usual bluster, pointed out. Scattered the group, took the coordination out of it. It was small, but it was something. Days turned into weeks, a grim rhythm of raiding, building, and the constant, gnawing fear at their backs. Sarah barely slept, driven by a desperation that was its own sort of strength, and Mayview, stubborn, isolated Mayview, was changing around her. Necessity, it turned out, was a far more potent force for unity than any preacher's words ever were. The drone came out of the dawn sky, a sleek silver flash against the jagged mountain peaks. Sarah froze, her hunter's instincts screaming at her to hide, but something kept her rooted to the spot. This wasn't one of the transformed, it was too precise, too purposeful. It circled the ragged camp, the faint hum of its engines cutting through the morning stillness. Mayview folks emerged from their fortified hovels, staring in a fearful mix of curiosity and defiance. Sarah's hand hovered over her salvaged rifle, useless against a threat like this. The drone descended, not on the camp itself, but a rocky clearing a short distance away. Sarah exchanged a tense look with her father. There was no hiding now. They approached cautiously, the transformed seemingly forgotten in the face of this new, unknown danger. A hatch slid open on the smooth underside of the drone. A package descended on a cable, then the drone lifted off once more, disappearing back towards the horizon. The silence after its departure was deafening. Sarah, with Ben and her father in grim attendance, approached the package. It was metal, utilitarian, secured with a complex keypad. Military, Ben ventured, his voice barely a whisper. Could be, Sarah admitted, but why them? Why now? With a mix of trepidation and desperate hope, she keyed in the combination etched on the side of the case. Old army protocol ingrained in her memory. Why would someone who deployed advanced tech use those basic safeguards? The case clicked open with a hiss of released pressure. Inside, neatly packed in foam compartments, were supplies, high-density rations, medical kits, a compact solar generator, and a communication device, sleek and far more advanced than anything Ellis had cobbled together. Panic and possibility warred in Sarah's gut. Had they stumbled into the middle of something even bigger than the monstrous threat in their own backyard? But the supplies, those weren't a test, they were desperately needed. Her father, as always, found the words amidst the muddle of fear and shock. Reckon the good Lord provides in mysterious ways, he murmured, but there was a sharp glint in his eyes that didn't quite match his pious tone. A decision was made. With painstaking care, they transported the new supplies up to their stronghold, the calm device held with a reverence usually saved for ancient Bibles. It pulsed a faint blue, humming with a power that felt both thrilling and frightening. Sarah, her mind racing, made the call. The response was garbled at first, static masking the voice, then with shocking clarity. Remote outpost November 3, please identify. Emergency frequencies are monitored. It was a woman's voice, crisp and strained with exhaustion, the words echoing oddly in the confines of their rough-hewn shelter. Sarah swallowed, every ounce of her training kicking in. This... This is not outpost November 3, Sarah began, every word measured. We are civilian survivors, Mayview Ridge, requesting assistance and intel. Current situation. She began to paint a picture of their desperate fight, of the evolving threat. The response, when it came, was a chilling mix of urgency and skepticism. Questions rattled out precise coordinates, details about the infection containment measures. Sarah answered as best she could, feeling the Mayview folk crowd in behind her, silent witnesses to this lifeline offered from an unseen world. The transmission ended abruptly, the calm device humming expectantly. The silence that followed was deafening. There was nothing now but to wait, and to wonder if in seeking help, they had doomed themselves to a different form of destruction. The wait was excruciating. Each rustle of the wind, every snap of a branch, became a potential prelude to attack. 
Sarah found herself scanning the skies with a wary dread, the threat of the drone replaced by an even more potent unknown. The survivors of Mayview hunkered down, a mix of grim determination and a flicker of something new, hope. They'd reached a breaking point with the twisted creatures at their doorstep, but this contact with the outside world, it changed things. There was something bigger at play, and perhaps, just perhaps, they weren't as alone as they'd felt. It was Ben who spotted it first. A flicker of movement on the distant road, not the lumbering chaos of the transformed, but something purposeful. His shout sent a jolt of panic through the makeshift settlement. Sarah scrambled to the ridge, old binoculars pressed to her eyes. Not an attack. A convoy. Military, by the look of it, moving with a precision that was utterly alien to the Transform's shambling chaos. Her breath caught. So, the woman's voice, the cryptic questions. This was the result. Her father was beside her in an instant, not the preacher now, but the leader forged in a crucible of desperation. Do we greet them? The question hung heavy in the clear mountain air. Farah hesitated. Was this salvation or scrutiny? Mayview folk had learned to trust no one but their own, but they'd also been brutally shown the limits of isolation. We greet them, she decided, but armed. The meeting was a clash of two worlds. The soldiers, hardened and wary behind mirrored visors, surveyed the ragged figures emerging from the makeshift fortifications. Sarah stepped forward, rifle slung but hands raised, the peace offering clear. Their leader, a woman with a voice etched with a weariness Sarah recognized all too well, lowered her visor. Explanations followed halting, filled with pauses, as the two groups struggled to understand the magnitude of what they faced. There was shock in the soldiers' eyes as Sarah recounted their grim fight, but also a grim respect for the ingenuity born of necessity. You might have stumbled onto something crucial, the woman Lieutenant Grayson, it turned out, told them, her voice businesslike. Your town, it could be a valuable forward base, if we can fortify it. A plan began to take shape. Grayson's team were scouts, forward eyes for a force stretched terrifyingly thin against a threat that was far, far more widespread than Mayview had ever imagined. It was chaos out there, a fractured struggle for survival amidst the relentless spread of the alien infection. But there was pushback too. Pockets of resistance forming where humanity wasn't ready to roll over just yet. We fight back, Sarah echoed her earlier declaration, but now it carried a different weight. Not blind defiance anymore, but an offer with a hardened edge. Grayson nodded, the gesture sharp. That's why we're here. But you gotta be ready, soldier. This is about to become a very different kind of war. The next few weeks were a blur of transformation. Mayview was fortified, crude defenses bolstered by military-grade tech. Soldiers became grimly familiar presences, teaching and learning in equal measure. Mayview's hunters, their woodland skills honed over generations, became invaluable trackers against a foe that had twisted familiar terrain into something horrifying. Sarah felt herself changing too. The haunted soldier, broken by a peace too quiet, found focus again. There was a battle here, one worth throwing herself into, and this time, she wasn't alone. And always, there was the thrum of work, of Ellis' scavenged tech evolving into something more purposeful, the crackle of the communication device bringing snippets of intel from far-flung outposts. The remnants of Mayview, their stubborn self-reliance amplified now, were proving their worth in the most brutal way imaginable. It wasn't the home Sarah remembered, but it was something stronger, a testament to the true potential of HFY. Not about dominance, but about finding unexpected strengths in the face of annihilation, about the stubborn, improbable spark of human resilience. The first major engagement came out of an icy mist that clung to the mountains like a shroud. Sarah wasn't leading the charge, not with Grayson and seasoned soldiers at the helm now, but she was part of it. Not an outsider looking in, but forged by necessity into something new. The transformed had evolved, just as they'd feared. Larger, stronger, with a terrifying echo of cunning in their movements. They surged from the mist, not a blind horde, but directed, driven. Sarah exchanged a grim look with Carl, his booming huntsman personality tempered into something leaner, deadlier. 
The battle was a chaos of gunfire and the rasping, guttural snarls of the transformed. Mayview's repurposed rifles, bolstered by military firepower, held the first line with surprising ferocity. It wasn't clean. People died soldiers, Mayview folk, falling in the mud and the slick crimson snow. But they held. Then came the second wave. Not out of the mist, but from the abandoned mine workings. Sarah had warned them, the sealed-off tunnels an ominous blind spot, but force limitations had dictated they hold the higher ground. Her stomach twisted in grim vindication as the things clawed their way back into the harsh daylight. This time it was chaos. The meticulously laid lines of defense shattered under the surprise assault, communications scrambled. Sarah, flanking Grayson, ended up back to back with Ben, all three firing wildly as the creatures closed in. Outnumbered, outmaneuvered, the bitter taste of defeat heavy on her tongue. Then it came a roar rising above the din. Not a creature's rasp, but the throaty bellow of heavy machinery. An old logging truck, armor plating hastily welded over its rusting body, Ellis hunched behind a salvaged machine gun retrofitted in the back, plowed through the melee. It was a gloriously ugly contraption, utterly Mayview in its defiant ingenuity. The gun roared, cutting swathes in the massed ranks of the transformed. The opening was narrow, a desperate gamble, but enough. Sarah, Grayson, and what was left of their group scrambled for the makeshift tank, Ben hauling up a wounded soldier with surprising strength. Retreat again, yes, but not a rout. They bought time, space to regroup, and behind them, Ellis's scavenged weapon roared a defiant last stand, giving them that precious chance. In the aftermath, as they grimly surveyed their losses, something was different. There was grief, exhaustion, but also threads of grim satisfaction. Grayson, her face streaked with mud and determination, turned to Sarah. Your people held. That machine gun stunt. She shook her head, a flicker of something close to a smile breaking through. Only a stubborn bunch of backwoods geniuses would try something like that. It bought us time, Sarah replied, her voice steady. It bought us hope, the lieutenant corrected. Because of that, we're not overrun right now. You proved something out there today. It was the moment Sarah realized the HFY trope wasn't about swagger or unbroken victories. It was about being forged in that crucible, the stubborn grit, the unexpected twist that pulled them back from the brink. It was Mayview, it was her, shaped by desperation into something more useful, more dangerous than they'd ever been. The road ahead was long, the war brutal. Yet, amidst the grim tally of sacrifices, flickered a defiant strength neither Sarah nor her changed hometown could have ever imagined possessing. The final battle wasn't some glorious charge. It was a tense, waiting game, fought in fortified trenches dug into the blood-soaked earth above Mayview, in the echoing tunnels of the old mine turned into a grim bastion. News had trickled in via Ellis cobbled together communications net other outposts fallen, towns overrun, the lines of defense pushed back with brutal speed. Mayview was now a beacon, a stubborn holdout on the ever-shifting front line. Grayson's forces, thinned and exhausted, bolstered by Mayview's hunters turned guerrilla warriors, were all that stood between the infected hordes and a vast swath of unprotected territory. They came not as a single, massive wave, but in relentless surges. The infected were learning, adapting. Sarah, bruised and sleepless, saw the chilling intelligence in their attacks now, the way they probed the defenses, seeking the cracks. Mayview's strength lay in the unexpected, crude stake traps triggered by tripwires, flash grenades scavenged and rewired with unpredictable intervals. They made the transformed pay dearly for every foot of ground, but still, the lines bent and buckled. Sarah lost track of days and nights. There was only the endless cycle of firing until her hands blistered, hauling the wounded back, whispering desperate words of comfort to the dying. Yet even amidst the despair, a cold fury burned bright within her. Mayview would not fall, not without a fight that scarred the enemy as deeply as it did them. Ben was killed by one of the larger evolved creatures, the monstrous parody of a human crashing through a barricade Sarah and him had shored up only hours ago. His death was a brutal shock, a chilling reminder that none of them were untouchable. 
yet even in her grief a vicious determination surged through her. She took up his salvaged rifle, swore a wordless oath over his broken body, and rejoined the desperate fray. It was Ellis, of all people, who turned the tide. His contraptions, dismissed by the military as crude at first, turned into their most valuable weapon. From rigged spotlights that blinded and disoriented the light-sensitive creatures to a network of salvage speakers broadcasting painful frequencies, he turned their makeshift tech into potent tools of chaos. But the real triumph came with the calm unit. With Grayson's grim guidance, Ellis tapped into an old satellite network, broadcasting their coordinates and a desperate plea for backup. The infected, drawn by the activity, surged towards the final stronghold. And in the echoing calm silence that followed, Sarah clung to a desperate sliver of hope that somewhere, somehow, the remnants of the human world would hear their call. The answer came from the skies, not in the form of a well-organized military strike, but in a patchwork collection of salvage jets, choppers held together with sheer stubborn will. Squadrons from outposts far and wide, answering Mayview's desperate beacon. It wasn't much, but it was enough to shatter the monstrous wave, to buy them another breath. When the dust settled and the ragged cheers echoed hoarsely against the mountain, Mayview still stood, broken, bleeding, but alive. Sarah stood amidst the wreckage, a survivor yet again, but forever altered. Mayview was the same scarred but unyielding, the stubborn spirit refined into something as sharp as a shattered blade. Grayson, leaning heavily on a salvaged crutch, offered Sarah a weary salute. Welcome to the real fight, soldier, she said, her voice rough. You all earned your damn place in it.